Well, I have to say, well done on the psalm. Good job. Um, sounded great. A stronghold, a refuge, a fortress. Words you've heard a few times already today. Well, I bring them to you again to consider what they mean. If you look up a definition for these words, you'll find something like this. A refuge is a condition of being safe or sheltered from pursuit, danger, or trouble. Or it is something that provides that kind of shelter. A fortress is a military stronghold, a fortified town, a place that is protected. A stronghold is a synonym of fortress a place that has been fortified so as to protect it against attack. In our psalm today that you sung so well, Psalm 46, we hear these words. These very same words were the inspiration for the hymn we sang at the beginning of the service today, A Mighty Fortress, a favorite among Lutherans. Martin Luther wrote it himself. And he took the language from this psalm, a mighty fortress is our God. But it doesn't always feel like that, does it? Today on Reformation Sunday, we remember Martin Luther, but it isn't really about Martin Luther, and I'm sure he would agree with me. In fact, We're told he was quite annoyed that we chose to name ourselves after him. He wanted it to be about Jesus. And that's really what today is about. It's about how God worked through a man named Martin Luther to help the church rediscover the gospel, the sweet, precious gospel we have in Jesus. So when he came to this realization in God's Word, around 1527, he wrote this hymn that we sang today. But Luther himself didn't always feel like God was his fortress. So what changed? Well, in Psalm 46, we're presented with a God who is over all things. Everything is within His grasp. In other words, He decides the fate of all. And for sinners like Luther and ourselves, this isn't by itself necessarily good news. It just means God is powerful. In fact, it could be the worst news ever. If, like Luther, you feel that you constantly stand in the place of judgment. Not only are you being judged by God, but He has all power in heaven and on earth, and it's all lined up against you. So in other words, it depends on how God, who is all-powerful, actually feels about you, whether or not these words bring comfort. And for much of his early life, Luther did not feel that. There's many famous stories about how he went to such extreme lengths to find his own atonement for his sins, only to be met with disappointment. No matter what he did himself, the guilt was never gone. The sins never went away. They kept coming relentlessly, pouring in and out of his heart. Confessing for hours didn't do it. Starving himself and fasts as a monk, hitting himself, didn't work. Those punishments didn't atone for his sin. So how does Luther go from that to a joyous confession, a mighty fortress is our God? Because if you read about his early life, he clearly feels that God is on the attack and that He is the object of that attack, an angry judge waiting to smite Him in His sin. And if we're being honest, we can feel that way sometimes ourselves, especially as Psalm 46 mentions, in the midst of our troubles, it can seem like God is against us. 
So what did Luther do? He turned to God's Word. And through the studying of God's Word, he came to a realization as he was looking and studying in the book of Romans that he was not correct, that his understanding of God and the way God felt about him was wrong. And in this case, it's good to be wrong. He discovered that Romans teaches us that the believer is made righteous not by works that he does, but by faith in the works of Jesus, by faith in Jesus Himself, who has come to make a perfect life in our place. The particular verse that's thought to be part of this tower experience, as it's called, is Romans 1, verse 17, which says, For in it the gospel... The righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Can you imagine how sweet this realization was for someone who felt that God was always holding his sins against him, and to find out that the righteousness that he so desired was instead a free gift of faith in God. Luther was so struck by this realization, he quoted this of the book of Romans, the most important piece in the New Testament. It is purest gospel. It is well worth a Christian's while not only to memorize it word for word, but also to occupy himself with it daily, as though it were the daily bread of the soul. A life-changing experience, one in which we share The Word of God has changed our lives in much the same way. So today as we celebrate the reclamation of the gospel, what better way to do it for ourselves than to turn to God's Word and meditate on the reality of the gospel so that we, like Luther and our psalmist, can declare boldly and with joy, God is our refuge and our strength. So the psalmist in Psalm 46, he has a complete trust in God. It's almost borderline arrogant. It assumes that all things are in his reach, that he holds dominion over all things, right? God is powerful, but it also proclaims how God feels about us. The psalmist's bold declaration about God is that he is our refuge an ever-present help for us in our times of trouble. In other words, all of that power and might that God has at His disposal, which you previously thought was lined up against you, is instead with you and for you and carried out in all of its glory on your behalf. Our God is our refuge and strength. The phrase, very present, help in trouble always struck me, because very present's a weird phrase in English. What does that really mean? And here it has the sense that it can be readily or easily found, that Jesus is readily or easily found in times of trouble. Now, this makes sense because a refuge and a fortress and a stronghold, those are all locations. They're places to be found. And they're not much good if you can't find them. A fortress isn't going to do you any good if you can't get inside of it and have it protect you. So therefore, because of this reality that God is a readily available, easily found refuge and strength for us, we have no fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, The psalmist is declaring this boldly. No matter what happens in all of creation, we need not fear. Now, there's two senses here um, with this uh, sort of cosmic imagery. The earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. It can be seen as the undoing of creation, or it can be seen as the times of trouble that come upon those who believe in Jesus. And really, there's no tension in holding both, because God is a refuge 
in both those things, even in the destruction of creation. The psalmist continues to arrogantly boast in God, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, and still there is no fear. What an incredible change. If you've read anything of Luther's early life, it's dominated by fear. Fear of God and His disapproval. Fear of never being good enough. And yet our psalmist declares that those who have a refuge in God have no fear, for He is protecting them from all things. But I ask you, are you dealing with serious troubles? It's all well and good for the psalmist to declare boldly that God is an ever-present, readily found help in those times, but the reality is that people often say that they feel God is far away in their troubles, that He isn't easily found, that He seems absent to them. In those moments you feel, well, it's easy in the comfort of your pew to make this declaration that God is our refuge and strength, but when things get really bad, it doesn't seem like He's around. You may be surprised to find that the psalmist agrees, that many of our psalms express this very same feeling. Here's a few examples. Psalm 22, verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? You ever felt like God isn't listening to your prayers? That's what the psalmist is expressing. Psalm 10, verse 1, Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Psalm 13, verse 1, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? So as we read Psalm 46, the psalmist's boldness almost begs the question, where is God readily found? If in times of trouble He seems far away and that expression is even borne out in the Psalms, where can we find God and what does His help look like? Well, the next section of the psalm leads us to a place, a place called the city of God, where God dwells in the midst of His people. Now, when Psalm 46 was written, this is clearly referring to Jerusalem and the temple, the house of God where He was dwelling in the midst of His people. And as long as He was there, it could not be moved. Here are the words again. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. But the great news for us in Jesus is now the dwelling place of God is with His people still, but it's no longer located in a particular city or building. But now it is in the people of God themselves. That's why when believers gather together and we talk about the church, we call it the body of Christ. That in your baptism, the Holy Spirit was given to you, His name was placed on you, and He adopted you as a child of God. And now He dwells in the midst of you. And when we gather together, He promises to come to us through means, through His Word, and through His sacraments. He promises to be readily found in those places. In those places, the glory and the majesty of an all-powerful God diminishes Himself to be found for your sake. All that power lined up behind you and next to you because it is for you and no longer against you. So there may be chaos in the world, but not here. There may be chaos in your own life, but not here with God. Here, the Lord of hosts, and that word Sabaoth, a lot of people think that means Sabbath. 
It's not. It's the Hebrew word for the God of armies, the heavenly host, an army of angels innumerable is with you and works for you. That's why when we get to verse 7, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The last point I'd like to meditate on from Psalm 46 as we celebrate the reclamation of the gospel and this reality that God is working for us instead of against us is a word that you've probably heard many times. This is verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. It's hard to be still when you feel like you're being pursued, when you feel like you're in danger, especially if you think that danger is coming from the most powerful being there is. But yet the psalmist says, be still. So today as we celebrate the reclamation of the gospel, I want you to do that. Be still. Whatever chaos or trouble you are experiencing in your life, be still. Be still and know that God is for you, that He sent His Son for you, that He gave you faith as a free gift of grace so that He might live forever with you in eternity a righteousness that is not your own, a righteousness that is manifested apart from the law, a righteousness given to you in love by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Do not let your hearts be troubled by the chaos of the world that you see around you or the chaos within your own heart and within your own life. Because God is your refuge and strength, you can be still, be at peace knowing that God is with you, that He is for you, that He loves screw-ups like Martin Luther, that He loves screw-ups like you and me, because it isn't about what we do, but it's about what He has already done for you. In Jesus, your sins have been forgiven, washed away. You no longer stand under the law, but under grace. And when He rose from the dead on Easter morning, He gave you His perfect righteousness, a righteousness by faith. Dear friends in Christ, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So we can boldly and joyfully sing, a mighty fortress is our God. Come and rest in Him. In the name of Jesus, amen.